Good afternoon. Thank you very much for doing the story today. Now you've chosen to stay anonymous. Yes, I have. Yeah. Um, I've chosen to stay anonymous mainly because I feel like if your child has a vaccine reaction, everybody tells you um, that it can't have been the vaccines and that... Um, you know that you're overreacting that it's only it only happens to a few people or it's like my doctor said for the greater good um yet when my son had a bad reaction to finnegan which is a third generation antihistamine um and his mouth and everything swelled closed everybody was sympathetic to me um they were like yeah it's in the side effects it can happen um is he okay you know that sort of thing i feel like if your child has a reaction to a pharmaceutical medication, everybody can accept it. But if your child has a reaction to a vaccine, then suddenly you're put on the anti-vaxxers list and the crazy list. And just for the record, I want people to know that I wasn't anti-vaccine um, because I vaccinated my child and this is what happened. And um, I've really enjoyed you know, vaxxed coming to New Zealand and worldwide because it's actually made me realise I'm not alone because I don't talk about this with a lot of people um, because I am afraid of the way that they will, you know, accuse me of not caring or loving for my, my other subsequent children because I am too worried to vaccinate them in case the same thing happens to them. So that's why I'd like to, you know, remain anonymous. I don't want to be judged. Um, because my child was hurt, you know, imagine how somebody else would feel if, you know, their child had a reaction to paracetamol and everybody told them that they're crazy and that it couldn't happen and that there's a lot of testing done on paracetamol and it's impossible to have a reaction to paracetamol um, and that, you know, it's all in their head or that it's for the greater good. Um, you know, that sort of thing. It doesn't feel like it's for the greater good when it's your child. That's so. a, a big insult, isn't it, to a mother? It is. To any parent. It is, it is. So I wanted to protect my child. And, you know, realistically, when I went in to vaccinate my child, I, I selfishly wasn't thinking of everybody else and the so-called herd immunity that people like to throw around all the time. I was thinking of my children. They were my number one priority. So I, herd immunity is not something that um, I don't think anyone really go, you know, really says, I'm going to do this for the herd immunity. They say, I'm going to do this for my child. So I, the herd immunity thing just doesn't sit right with me, um, you know, when your child's the one that comes off second best. So. And you're a young mum and you didn't, you didn't, rush into vaccination no you did have your your doubts I did have my doubts so my son um I just had I was always very pro-vaccination and it was only when I got pregnant that I actually started reading into it pros and cons um so I wanted to see both sides of um of how it was and one thing that really resonated me with me was that you can always delay vaccination, but you can't undo it. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, well, I'm going to um, build and work on my child's immune system. A lot of um, information that I looked at um, did look at things like uh, diet and, you know, vitamin A being um, a deficiency or vitamin C, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a lot um, more involved than that. It's not uh, like as simple as just throwing your child on a vitamin A supplement, but um, it made me realize that I could try and manage my child's health as best as I could um, until such a point that I did decide to vaccinate. Um, and that point came at um, my child who was about 4.8 years old. He was a little bit late, but we went to the doctor for his um, before school check, which is something that we do in New Zealand before a child goes to school. So they check cognitive development, um, they check, um, you know, just that they're progressing correctly. Mental milestones. Well, yep, that everything. And he had, had, had no vaccines up to that point. He'd had no vaccines up until that point. So because he'd had um, reactions to medications um, and that sort of thing, I, I was quite... There was alarm bells there. Yeah, it was, I was standoffish. So I went to the before school check and she checked him over and she said, oh, he's perfectly healthy, very intelligent child. So um, he was uh, 
you know, able to do and recognize all his alphabet and count from about 14 months old all by himself. So we never had any influence. I never did that. I read to him every night. Um, so we have, you know, we've got it all on film because we were quite proud parents and, mm. you know, we probably got accused of showing off sometimes. But, you know, he didn't know the alphabet song, you know, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It was all, you know, visual. So the doctor was very pleased with his progress. He, um, you know, could read words and that sort of stuff. So by this stage, he was about four months out from going to school. So we were a little bit late doing that um, before school check. That's normally done at four years old. Um, and while we were there, basically the doctor um, piped up and said there was a measles outbreak um, in the city about an hour and a half from us. Um, and that if I cared and loved my children, then I should get them vaccinated and that in the whole time he's been a doctor, um, never once has he seen a vaccine reaction, um, you know, I told him my concerns, Liam had um, been under a paediatrician previously for his allergies and that sort of thing and he said it was all perfectly fine, he's done a million of these, you know, vaccinations and blah blah blah, so I thought well you know what, I really trust this person, he's really listened to me, well I'll just get it done. I just, you know, I thought, I'm scared, but I'm just going to jump in and I'm going to do it because I don't want my child to be affected by um, this deadly measles disease that the doctor kept telling me about. Although, ironically, my mum had told me that I'd had it as a child and I was perfectly fine. But anyway, um, so we did that and we went in and he had four injections um, for a total of 21 different vaccines that day. Um, he had the... Um, diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis, he had Hib, he had Prevnar 13 at the time and he had the MMR which is the measles, mumps and rubella. So That's we, a lot in one day. It's really scary because after this all happened I actually asked the doctor what kind of testing he could show me that they had done having so many combined in a day because it was the, not only the, um, the viruses that they were putting into the my child it was also the adjuvants like is there any testing done on the accumulation of the adjuvants that are actually used in the vaccine you sound like you've done a lot of research well I have read and read a lot of studies and that sort of thing but apparently it's just a google degree and I don't have any validity in what I'm saying because I'm not a medical doctor um, I could go on about how much training they actually have in <laughs> vaccines but I won't go there um, anyway, so um, cut a long story short, um, my son was perfectly fine when we were leaving the doctor's office, so um, he'd been running around with his younger sister who had also been vaccinated um, at that um, trip. I just thought, Let, let's get it done. She was just over three years old, um, happy as, uh, got into the car, we came home, um, you know, played around, and then three hours later was when... I knew things were starting to go wrong, so he started to um, limp. He couldn't walk um, properly, but he also started to scream. And the scream is not like it's not like a scream, you know, when he falls over and hurts himself. It's not like a scream when "Mummy, you didn't give me what I wanted. I'm having a tantrum." It was the most blood curdling scream I'd ever heard in my life. And initially, when he started screaming, he'd been in his bedroom, and um, it just continued and continued. And so. At about 7 o'clock, I rang our doctor surgery, who was actually still open because they're an accident in medical centre, and said, can you hear my son? Can you hear how he's screaming? There's something really, really wrong. He had his vaccinations today. And the nurse said, oh, no, it's all fine. This is normally what happens. Um, he's just angry you gave him a prick. And so she hung up, and I, I was so confused because I was like, no, this isn't just... He was perfectly fine when I left. He has no room, like he has no animosity towards me because I gave him a prick. Like I don't understand why she's saying this. Anyway, my husband was really concerned, and so we rang another accident to medical, who advised me just to give him some pamol and see how he goes. Turns out that could have been that was the worst thing I could have given to him, which I only found out from the immunologist later on. But anyway, um, we gave him the pamol. It made no difference. He was screaming. By this point, uh, 9 o'clock, he couldn't walk anymore. He was dragging himself along the floor in commando. Um, his legs just weren't working, and he was screaming at me, Mummy, please help me, please save me. Um, 
Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I understand. I feel like I'm hearing my story. And it just keeps saying my head is on fire. And you, you had an older child like I did. Yeah. And these little babies, they, they can't even speak. I'm really thankful that I You're didn't so give it brave. to him. You're so brave for telling your story. I'm just glad I didn't give it to him when he was a baby because I actually feel like after seeing what happened to him and how he reacted, I don't think he would have lived through it. No. Does that make sense? Um, so the whole but when night... When you hear that child just cry and say, please help me. Please save me. Yeah. That's what he kept saying. Please save me, mummy. Um, he said it, his whole body felt like it was on fire, his back, his head, his legs. He couldn't use his legs. Um, I rang the hospital at 2 o'clock that morning and um, basically they just said, oh, just monitor him overnight and see how he goes. Obviously by the morning it wasn't better. He's still screaming. He screamed the whole night. I laid beside him crying, asking myself what I had done and why I thought measles would be worse than what I was experiencing. We went down to the doctors. As soon as they opened, I was there waiting for them and I s carried him in there because he could not walk. Um, and I said to them, I need to see a doctor. And they said, oh, we don't have any appointments. And I screamed at them, I need to see a doctor. My son has had a vaccine reaction. I have been up all night with him and I need to see my doctor. How can they not, how, how can they not take that seriously? Oh, they, honestly, I just think that doctor surgeries are a lot different to when I was growing up. When I was growing up, my doctor knew my, my mum's medical history, my dad's, all the children he delivered us. There was not that breakdown in communication like there is now. At my doctor's surgery, it's hit and miss as to whether I actually get my GP. They have a walk-in service, and you're in and out within 15 minutes, and that's just the way it is. So if you, we've become a number. That's how I feel. I feel like I've lost trust in... Um, in you made me cry. Yeah, <laughs> I made me cry too. But, you know, I, I took him down, and then they said... Um, you know, they checked his temperature. He actually surprisingly never got the temperature that they talk about. He just yeah. got the screaming. And um, again, they told me to give him some more Pamol, so we gave him more Pamol. Um, it didn't, it didn't, it just wasn't helping him. Like, he just kept saying, just save me, mummy. He just was so clingy and was stuck to me. So he never walked for three weeks. And in that time, we underwent um, heaps of testing um, he had a lot of pressure in his head. Um, they did scans on him. They did blood testing. Blood testing um, turned up a myriad of different um, things, but nothing that they would say was actually connected to, uh, to the actual vaccination. Um, which, you know, he, yeah, anyway, I just feel like if I had not vaccinated my child that day, would we have come home and would he have not been able to walk and had this horrible... Um, you know, extreme would he, headache. Would, would he have happen? suffered a coincidence? That's right. And <laughs> I just feel like, no, he wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have. Um, not only that, but around the injection site in both of his legs, he had these massive um, knots. So they were very, very big lumps. And um, after I circled them, because they kept growing and growing and growing, they were around about, uh, one was 15 centimetres and one was around about 18 centimetres round. So it actually encompassed his entire um, thigh area. So it was very, very long um, and hard and um, and painful. So, um, yeah, so we underwent all of that. And in the meantime, obviously, um, I tried to connect with other parents that have been through what this was. And I heard about something called chelation therapy um, that I could potentially use to help detox him. I got recipes for detox baths with which had things like Epsom salts, diamaticus earth, um, you know, baking soda, etc, etc. Um, I made poultices that I put on the injection sites to help draw the toxin from him. Um, we had genetic testing done and we found out that he had a gene um, that makes it very difficult for his body to methylate properly and it turns out about 40% of the population has the same gene. So um, it was really concerning that they'd still 
vaccinated him. And what is that gene? It's the MTHFR gene mutation. Um, so there's a lot of information. And you actually had that um, as a test in New Zealand? Yes, we had that blood tested. It was sent away to Australia, I believe, to okay. get that gene but, uh, immunologist in New Zealand sent that away. was aware enough to test for it? Yeah, that's right. That's amazing. I didn't know if it was a normal test that they did or not, but I've heard from other um, parents that I've connected with you know, because I just want to know that, you know, like I feel like I'm alone. I can't talk to my friends about this because the majority of them are pro-vaccine. They share memes online, like basically calling me, and you know, people in my situation, crazy anti-vaxxers, like put on your tinfoil hat, all that sort of stuff. And I just... Do you feel like an anti-vaxxer? I'm an ex-vaxxer. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I was, you know, I didn't go around saying to people, don't vaccinate your child. I was always very pro-choice. Do what feels right for you. Great. You've vaccinated your child and your child's fine. Fantastic. Like, you know, but I don't feel like an anti-vaxxer. And I feel like I'm put into, I'm lumped into a group that I don't belong to. So it's hard to feel like you belong somewhere because I actually did vaccinate my child and this is what happened to us. So it really hurts when I see people sharing that and I know that they're not doing it personally to me but it just feels so personal because a lot of them um, aren't aware of actually what we went through. We did um, post things on our Facebook about Liam being paralysed and that sort of thing but a lot of people don't remember it. Um, Liam actually doesn't remember it himself either. He has no recollection of that ever happening to him. But we were under a really good homeopath who we went through chelation therapy for about 18 months to two years. Um, we've probably dropped about $10,000 into treatments to get his gut health restored and to... Um, so he had a gut problem Gut afterwards. problem. We had um, heavy metal testing done. Yeah. He had a heavy How was his gut? Was he heavily constipated or... Very what happened diarrhea? was he went diarrhea. Yeah. It actually it actually flowed from constipation to diarrhea. Yeah. Like it, it flipped that's, and flopped. That's what I find is common. Yeah, yeah. So um And was it that was it would you have said it was like a normal stool when it was diarrhea or did it No, it was a diff it had a putrid smell. Okay. I didn't want to put those words in your yeah, mouth. No, but no, I it, would it actually describe it as acid. Yeah, it was awful and um Oh, quite often my husband would go into the bathroom after he had been in there and be like, oh my God, it sounds like something crawled up there, died and actually fermented in his gut. It was just so disgusting. Um, so yeah, so we went through um, through all of that. We, we completely overhauled his nutrition, which actually wasn't bad. And, and you know, originally we mm. were, you know, very conscious of so how, how did you know because mm. i'm a lot older mm. how, how did you know to to go and do all, all this is there like information online about a vaccine reaction yeah so basically okay. i joined a group which was a re-education group a vaccination re-education group okay. and basically read all the files and there's a lot of um there's a lot of um, medical journal information in there um testing that's been done and i just read and read and read so you had more support and help from the parents yeah that's right and they gave me advice and they had advised what they had done and what have worked for them so there were children there uh, well parents there that have, have had children that had had vaccine reactions 30 years ago when i was yeah. getting my schedule 20 years ago 10 years ago so it's not something that's actually new and i think what it is is that back when um you know i was young and other children were being vaccine you know vaccinated there wasn't the outlet, like you couldn't go online and talk to other people, you couldn't find people in your community, it's not like they had support groups for vaccine injured children, like there wasn't the availability of things that there are now, so I guess this is going to sound really horrible, I'm lucky that my son had the vaccine reaction when he did because there's a lot more awareness now and there was a lot of advice and things that we could go through. Like thank God for social media. Thank God for social media because I would have been alone um, the doctors didn't know what to do with him. I went in about two weeks after it happened because I kept going back to the doctor saying, I need him to walk again. Can you help me? Like, what do I do? And they actually told me not to come back. They said, stop coming back. We can't make him walk. Um, so I didn't want my child to be paralyzed. He'd had the use of his legs from when he was born. and um, So they, they just wanted to get rid of you? They didn't know what to do. I guess they just got frustrated because yeah. they were like, what can we do? We don't know. 
you know, and so I guess they got frustrated because I was taking up appointments and they told me several times, we don't know what to do, we don't know what to do, stop coming back. Um, so they're happy to coerce you into having a vaccine. But there was no support. Like, that's what mm. I said to my husband, I just feel so They don't alone. know what vaccine reaction is, though, because they've been told over and over again it's not happening. Yeah, and I, I mean, I understand that because when I sat down with them, they gave me a leaflet on vaccinations and when I read the, you know, I went through it and it was like, they had um, common reactions, which were a fever, restlessness, um, that sort of thing. And then they had uncommon reactions, which were things like um, a knot at the injection site. Um, you know, they'd stop, you know, appetite would go, that sort of thing. But there was no mention of paralysis. There was no mention of encephalitis. There was no mention of any of those other things that I've since found out, since I've actually read a proper insert. Now, the insert is a thing that comes in the box with the actual vaccine vial. And to get proper informed consent, I feel like we should be given these inserts at a different appointment. Take them home, make sure we're aware of everything that um, it's, is good about the it's vaccine. It's got a lot of information on it. It's got a lot more information. And since reading those inserts, there were a couple of things that stood out to me. So one of the vaccinations he had had something called neomycin, which is an um, antibiotic. Um, and prior to getting his vaccines, he actually has a allergy to erythromycin and neomycin. So first of all, he was injected with something he should never have had because the vaccine insert itself says that no child who has an allergy to these things should be um, injected with it. The other thing was MSG. And when my son has MSG, his he gets a swallow. So basically his mouth swell, swells up. He has a bad reaction to that as well. And MSG was also in one of the vaccines that he was given. So my doctor actually was not aware of that um, you know, until after the fact when I went back to him and said, hey, this is actually in the vaccination and you gave it to my son and you injected it into him. And I don't care how it's done, subcutaneously, intramuscularly, whatever. My son has it as a food and has a terrible reaction. I can't even imagine what it's like having it injected in him when it actually bypasses his gut and all those other safety um, mechanisms that the body has for any toxin. So, um, and he didn't even know that it was even in the vaccine himself. He wasn't even aware of the actual ingredients. He, you know, kept apologising, I'm sorry we've given this to your child when your child shouldn't have had it. And, you know, so it's been a really long process of... Um, just did he report the reaction so I kept going back and um, I actually rang IMAC which is the um, immunization advisory um, center in Auckland run by Auckland University so that's basically yeah who runs everything and um, so I rang them and they actually said yes your doctor does need to report it they said he has had um, you know it's not a usual um, reaction but it's not unheard of um, and not, not usual, but there's a big basket there. I know of it's people. Actually, terrifying. It's not only them; it's just everyone. It's it's a common denominator. But but anyway, they encouraged my doctor to um, to register the reaction. And a few months later, when it was finally done, it it was a long. It was actually a really long process to actually get them to admit that he'd had a reaction to vaccines. My doctor didn't want to um, actually um, write that down. I guess, and um, yeah, so when they actually did put it in, it was described as um, a headache and pain in legs. So that's what his reaction was put down as, not paralysis and encephalitis, brain encephalitis. So um, that really... So he really toned it down. He really toned it down, and it really annoyed me because there are parents that will go through the vaccine reactions, you know, you can um, request those as part of the Official Information Act, and they will go through them and they will not see anybody there that has had the same reaction as their child because they haven't been accurate in their description of what's actually happened. So I feel like um, it's inaccurate and it's upsetting for people like me who get told that, you know, sorry, your kid can't walk, but um, it's just um, leg pain and sorry your kid screamed for around about 72 hours straight and begged me to save him and stop the fire in my head and my body but it's just a headache you know like I just feel like really that's what you'd call a headache I don't know I I almost it sounds like medical neglect to me to be yeah. honest 
I just feel like if I told them that I'd give him, given him an antibiotic and that had happened, they'd be, st you know, st straight into hospital, straight giving him IV fluids, trying to find out a solution, medicating him um, to um, dull the pain and that sort of thing. But as soon as you mention that it's he had a vaccination, it's kind of, I don't know, they almost actually shut off right to my face. So, yeah, after a lot of money and... Um, he's, do, he's doing okay. I've met him. He's, he's, doing, he's doing okay. He, I am so lucky. He is doing great. I'm so lucky I got onto all of that stuff really early and mm. I didn't wait a year or two lucky years. Lucky and smart. Yeah, all three years. And lucky that I had the, I have the money. I've got a husband who has a very good job and he can support us and we were able to spend that money and actually access services that... Unfortunately, if you're in a lower income, you can't access those services. Like, you just can't. It's, I don't know anybody that could just go and fork out the amount of the hundreds of dollars we were spending every month. It would break my heart if I couldn't have done that for my and child. And I've noticed um, meeting the younger mums that know where to run when basically the shit hits the fan, mm -hmm. that... Um, by reacting so quickly and recognising what's happening, you're actually getting your kids back. That's right. You're, you know? Yeah. Th this is not the first story. No, that's right. So um, I guess because of social media, as everybody gets their stories out, you know, I'd read other stories. I mean, I was pretty clued up. I, I was aware of things that could go wrong. I'd read... Um, books and studies by do you know by actual doctors people always talk about oh you've got a Google degree blah 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 these were books written by doctors that were opposed to vaccinations I had read a lot of that stuff so you looked at both sides of the fence. I looked at both sides of the fence you delayed you went ahead with an older child and I still got burned I feel like I still got yeah but that was that was on me and I'm glad that it's not mandatory because I needed to own this for myself. I'd made this decision myself. That was on me. Yes, the doctor had coerced me and made me feel bad for having this outbreak an hour and a half away that could potentially make my child ill. Um, who could get encephalitis from this from this How terrible ironic. illness, which turns out is not common in measles either. Um, but anyway, moving along from all that, that was my decision. So... Um, I feel like it had to have been my decision. I would feel really like a lot more angry if that was forced on me. So I'm glad that in New Zealand we still have that freedom of choice to make the best decision for our family. And um, unfortunately, I made the worst decision for my son, and I have to live with that. And you know, luckily, I had read a lot of other stories where people had successfully detoxed their children and got them very, very quickly. I mean, within four days of his reaction, we were in seeing a homeopath um, who specialises in this sort of thing. Um, we'd been to see naturopaths. We had already, um, as well as having the bloods done through the hospital and my doctors, we had also had bloods done for heavy metal testing through a... Um, through a doctor who was a GP, but also... Um, who specialises in um, naturopathic medicine and that sort of thing. So he had already sent off um, all the testing, which goes over to America, his ones, I believe. So um, we had bloods tested, like sent over to Australia, bloods tested to, and sent over to America um, for all of that. So that costs a lot of money um, to mm. get that done. And Did he show up high in, in um, heavy metal? Yeah, he did. He did show up high. He had like a lot of... Um, uh, he had highs... Uh, lead. lead that was it lead always comes I was out. like why has he got high lead because we didn't have you know we lived in a brand new house obviously lead I free I, I just think that we saturated the environment so much with lead it's mm. it's in our food it's in our water it's it, it's in the mums yeah it's just it's, they've also found the um, vaccines are contaminated with nanoparticles of heavy metals yes but I read that they didn't actually have to declare that because it's nanoparticles so they don't well, actually it's way worse because yeah. it's nano... yeah. there's a new research paper on that um but yeah did he so have arsenic he had arsenic and ironically the kid had never even had rice so somebody told me oh you can have high arsenic if you have a lot of rice in your diet you know um a lot yeah. of a lot of mums is their first food and yeah. our plunket books in new zealand are told to give their children farex 
which incidentally can have arsenic. Yeah. yeah, so I said... But I think it's coming... Like, it could he been, was your first born. He was my first born, so we, I probably we, detoxed into him. We, that's what you do with your first... It's, 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 not, it's not Google Doctor, that's what... A mum does. She That's right. She dumps her toxins on her first two kids. Well, ironically, when I had um, all that testing and everything, and I was talking to the immunologist, the immunologist said to me, quote, the best way to detox is to have a baby, unquote. Mm. So I, and I, that was, blo I was blown away by that because I'd never heard of that. And if I'd known that, I probably would have detoxed before I had even I'm, gotten I'm, considered I'm getting pregnant. I'm shocked about this immunologist because... This was a different one. This was the one. Oh, that, okay. Because, yeah. like, the, you, you know, you've, you've met an immunologist that knows about MTHFR. Now, mm -hmm. I've run MTHFR several years ago um, past one of the top immunologists in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and he didn't know what that was. So this was, so how many years ago was that? Because Liam's reaction was... Probably 2000. Three years ago. Yeah, yeah, so Liam's reaction was three years ago. So I don't know if they're just becoming more aware that methylation could be an issue and how... And how people process, um, you know, these things. I'm, it's I definitely the difference between the vaccine reactors and the non-vaccine reactors. They're MTHFR carriers. And the mums, because you're an MTHFR carrier, I'm an MTHFR carrier. So that means that we've absorbed toxins instead of our heavy metal. Mm. And the only way for us to release them is exactly. to have a child. Yeah, exactly. So. And if we could just be aware of that. Mm. Um, and then with his testing, I presume that he had probably lead, arsenic, mercury and aluminium. Yeah, they're all the four. of them, yeah. I've seen the tests over and over again. Mm. We could be having these tests done when the children are born. Ironically, I'm actually getting them retested um, in the next few weeks. So we've got an appointment with the uh, same practitioner who's a GP and mm. um, he does all the testing. So we're going back there. Um, to have his levels tested to see, you know, because he has MTHFR and very conscious now of the build-up of environmental toxins as well as, you know. Mm. And that's when we kind of start looking like the crazy parents because we've gone to natural products in the house, natural mm. shampoos, natural cleaners. It's we don't even use cleaners, we just use NEO products, which yeah, just require like water. Or organic food. It's yep. because they're canaries in a coal mine. That's right. And we have to eradicate everything in their That's environment. That's exactly right. Reduce Wi-Fi. Yep. We, that gets shut off every single night, so they're not here during the day. I'm, not, I'm only, you know, I'm only having this conversation now. I just know mm. that you're probably doing that. Too. Yeah, we've had to have us because that's leader the removed. mother's advice. Mm from the older ones that's coming down in the group. So yep. that's what we've learned over the last yep. 20, 30 years. And I guess, I mean, you know, I don't know. I kind of feel like um, I really listen to people who are a few, a few generations older than us. I've seen things. I've seen Agent Orange, DDT. They've seen all of that stuff and the health effects that it ha has had on people. So when these sort of people from older generations come through to me and say, be careful, you know, watch what you're doing. We never did this you know, mumps and everything. Like, I had mumps. My brother had mumps. Um, we had measles. We were vaccinated. But I guess the combined MMR wasn't brought in until the 90s, I think, in New Zealand or the late 80s. So we were early 80s, so we had separate um, injections. Um, and my, you know, that was it. That was the only thing that anybody was, you know, worried about. And polio. Um, and you weren't getting pneumococcal, meningococcal, no. hip B, hip A, I don't know. The I, didn't even, I didn't even rotor, hear rotavirus, right, rotavirus. 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 I didn't even hear about it. And what about varicella now? Yeah. I mean, you, you're now, you it's, can track that in as well. <laughs> it's really ironic, that one, actually, because I, you know, only just a few years ago, people were still having chicken pox parties. Like, you know, <gasps> it's like, oh, I but know. That's so bad. It's bioterrorism, apparently. But, you know, like... Don't um, mention the deadly word, chicken pox. <laughs> exactly. And everybody's very fearful of it. Now, it's suddenly, um, you know, come onto the schedule and everybody's really, really fearful. And I kind of feel like, whoa, wh what's happened? Is the strain changed? Like, has something changed between the childhood chicken pox that my uh, mum had and that I like, had? It's um, like, if you want to launch a product, let's use Coca-Cola as an example... Mm then you're going to do a, a nice advertising campaign mm. and spend you know, you a big it. company. Like if Coca-Cola want to do a different flavour, because mm -hmm. they're already really, you know, a trillion dollar company, mm -hmm. then they can um, do a really awesome ad campaign to tell you how much you need that new flavour of Coca-Cola. Mm. 
So yeah. that's exactly the same with the 